I think to set the context for everything we're going to talk about, to set the foundations properly, I think it'd be helpful if we can have a quick introduction to quantum mechanics. So I'm going to ask you a very simple question. What is quantum mechanics? What is the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics? Well, here's the problem. It's not clear what the Copenhagen interpretation is. <laughs> yeah. It would be very nice if there was some very clear thing. It would say, here's what it is, and here are its difficulties. Part of the difficulty in talking about its difficulties is you don't know what it is. I don't think any two physicists agree on what the Copenhagen interpretation really is. There was the, the rules of textbook quantum theory. There was that. And there, and you can add on to those rules some quantum philosophy associated with Niels Bohr. Mm -hmm. Does the Copenhagen interpretation include that philosophy? Well, maybe if, you, if, you are, if you're talking about what most physicists believe, and I would say most still would say they adhere to the Copenhagen interpretation, they don't understand Bohr's philosophy. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about the usual rules they learn and some rough and ready principles that go along with those rules to avoid embarrassing questions. One of those rough and ready principles might be shut up and calculate, which I think is, uh, might be healthy in some respects, but really is quite opposite of my understanding of what physics should be involved, should involve. Calculation is important, but you shouldn't shut up. You should try to understand the calculations and you should understand what your theory you're working with, be it plausible or implausible, actually says. And it's not clear what the Copenhagen interpretation says, even textbook quantum theory. Why is textbook quantum theory obscure? Even without the philosophy? There are a whole bunch of measurement axioms rules for what happens in measurement. And part of the problem with that is that once you begin to understand those rules, it should be clear to you, but it probably doesn't become clear enough that whatever you have in mind when you're talking about measurement, it's not really measurement. Because one of the things you learn is that until you look Quantities which you are measuring don't have values. Well, if they don't have, they typically don't have values before you look, then you're not measuring anything. You're not me measuring means finding out what's there. If there's not something there, you're not measuring. So it's not clear what those axioms involving measurement are actually describing because they're not describing genuine measurement. So that's one example of the vagueness. There's a what else is vague? What, what is, what's fundamentally real in quantum mechanics? Totally obscure. There's very little commitment. If you used to take a whole course and many, almost go through your graduate school in quantum mechanics, you're studying courses in quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, all kinds of stuff. It's, it will probably not be entirely clear to you what is real in a quantum universe. What is quantum mechanics fundamentally about? You can't. And how can you say you actually understand the theory if you don't know what it's fundamentally about? Can I ask you just to step back for a minute and then define what is textbook quantum? I take your point about that there is no agreement or consensus around what is the Copenhagen interpretation, but what is currently the textbook quantum theory? What are we measuring? What is the wave function? That will be helpful to introduce these concepts because then we would be covering them when we talk about pilot wave theory as well. Well, I mean, the question of what is the wave function is, is not exactly something you actually learn. The key, a key ingredient in textbook quantum theory is that a system yeah. is described by its wave function. It has a wave function. What, and that wave function is a pretty abstract object. Mm -hmm. And this gets difficult for somebody who doesn't know a little bit of quantum mechanics to begin with. What kind of object is the wave function? Well, it's a function on a fairly abstract space. It's only in very simple cases that the wave function of a system is reasonably simple. And even there, it's not that, that simple. For example, in textbook quantum theory, the wave function of a single particle is a function, complex valued function, but a function on physical space. 
three-dimensional space. That's just for a single particle. And without spin, it's a bit more compli complicated the way this wave function, even for a single particle, if the particle has spin, I'm not going to get into that. And if you're talking about two particles, the wave function is a function of the positions of both particles, which means it's a function not on physical space, but on a higher dimensional space, really. If there are two particles in three dimensional space, it will be a six dimensional space. And for a decent sized system with a large number of particles, it's going to be a very high dimensional space. And one of the things you learned is that really is the state of the system, which means that's a complete description of the system. There's no, there are no further facts about the system than what, what is conveyed by the wave function. That is a striking statement, although it probably sails under the radar for most, student, most students. So for example, um, for a single particle system, particle in space, the wave function does not tell you what the position of the particle is, so the particle doesn't actually have it. There's no fact of the matter as to the position of the particle, which is to say the particle doesn't have a position. Yeah. It just has a wave function. And then there's a famous evolution equation for the, this wave function, a very nice equation, one of the fundamental equations in quantum mechanics called Schrodinger's equation. Mm -hmm. Very nice equation. Mathematically, it's well understood. Schrodinger's equation. Um, but while it's mathematically understood, so you know how the wave function changes with time, how the wave function is connected to physical reality is obscure. That's why you have in textbook quantum theory more than just the evolution law for the wave function, Schrodinger's equation. Because if you just had Schrodinger's equation, you would have trouble understanding where the predictions come from. There is one version of quantum mechanics where you do just have Schrodinger's equation, and then you do a lot of analysis to extract predictions. That's the many worlds interpretation. That is not textbook quantum theory. In textbook quantum theory, you have a whole bunch of further axioms, rules, in addition to just the evolution law, the, the first rule, which says you have a wave function evolving according to Schrodinger's equation, and you're told it's the complete description of a system. Then you have measurement axioms, which tells you, so to, it's supposed to tell you what happens when you perform measurements, which are not really measurements. So, which, so I should better say, if I want to be more accurate, which tell you what happens when you perform certain experiments on a quantum system. And it gives you rules for the probability distribution of the result of that experiment. Um, what experiment exactly is a bit obscure? Because it's not, it's not clear, because they're not really measurements. So that's a, that's a whole story. Experimentalists know what experiments to do, but it's never conveyed very clearly in a, in, 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 um, in a quantum mechanics course or in a textbook on quantum mechanics. Although Landau and Lipschitz, I think, do a decent job. That's a famous textbook. So you learn how to calculate, calculate all kinds of things if in a standard course, but you're not, it's not at all, it should not be at all clear to you what it is exactly that you are calculating. <laughs> so that makes it a little difficult to be a quantum mechanics student, and that's why it's probably just good advice to the poor student to just shut up and calculate. <laughs> learn how to do the calculations. Don't worry about what it all means. Good advice because you're not going to get what it all means if, you, if it's a standard text on quantum mechanics or a standard course. Better not to ask. Yeah, your colleague Richard Feynman had said uh, nobody really understands quantum mechanics. I guess it was more of a comment about how vague and incoherent it's got. Okay, you, you brought up a lot of limitations of textbook quantum theory at the moment and I definitely want to linger on them and break them apart a bit more. Currently, there's this wave function that defines particles, which is, like you mentioned, this abstract complex value function. And you mentioned something interesting around the way, how the wave function connects to physical reality is quite obscure at the moment. Albert Einstein, I'm sure the name rings a bell to you, once said about quantum theory that this theory reminds me a little of the system of delusions 
of an exceedingly intelligent paranoic concocted of incoherent elements of thoughts and then in a paper title can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete known popularly as the epr paper he went on to say whatever the meaning assigned to the term complete the following requirement for a complete theory seems to be a necessary one every element of the physical reality must have a counterpart in the physical theory we should call this the condition of completeness can you expand on this further why is it important to have this physical counterpart or sorry have this counterpart in a physical theory why is it such a big problem and for that reason why is einstein considering the copenhagen interpretation incomplete well no no theory can explain everything but if you you have a if you have your theory and you're saying it is the final theory then it better encompass everything in physical reality. It does, if it leaves something out, then you need a further theory to, to take care of what's left out. Now, yeah. the uh, founders of quantum mechanics were not suggesting when they say the way function is a complete description. They were, not, they were not allowing for something to be left out. They're not saying, oh, we would need a further theory. Quantum theory is only some provisional thing which describes only a limited aspect of reality. That would be a reasonable thing to say, but even if it were something which described only a limited domain, it ought to say, describe everything in that domain. If it describes atoms it ought to, or particles, it ought to describe all aspects of the particles. So Einstein simply pointed out that it turns out that quantum theory, in talking about a, a quantum mechanical system, it, there are physical features of that system which are not captured by the wave function. The way, so that the wave function is not contrary to what is so often said that the wave function is a complete description of the system. Einstein argued that it can't be a complete description of the system. There are things that are left out. And if their wave function is in fact not a complete description, then you should do better and actually include the things that are left out in that description. That might help you understand what your theory is about after all. It was the incompleteness of the wave. The wave function description is so incomplete that it leaves out any coherent answer, at least from my point of view, to what the theory could be about. Suppose you have a theory about particles, for example. It's supposed to be about particles, but you leave out the particles. That's a pretty big, that's leaving out a lot, like the whole story. That's what Einstein had in mind. So incompleteness was a very serious flaw. It means saying the theory is incomplete. If you concede that your theory is incomplete, that means you have more work to do. That's why quantum physicists wanted to resist the idea that their theory was incomplete. They wanted to use the theory to get new predictions, new, more and more predictions using that theory and not have to go back to the drawing boards to get a better theory, which completeness would seem to demand. I mean, which incompleteness would seem to demand. Yeah. 